Hi, welcome to our NOAA Day at the Aquarium presentation on sustainable recreational fishing on the West Coast. My name is Daniel Stutt and I am the Rec Fish Coordinator for the West Coast Regional Office of NOAA Fisheries. The West Coast offers diverse fishing opportunities for saltwater recreational anglers and I'm here today to educate you on some of the steps to take to support those fisheries and ensure those opportunities are available for generations to come. So who or what is NOAA Fisheries? Well, NOAA Fisheries, also known as the National Marine Fisheries Service, is the federal agency tasked with understanding, protecting, and managing our ocean resources and their habitats. So we ensure sustainable and productive fisheries, we ensure safe sources of seafood, we recover and conserve protected species, including threatened and endangered species like orcas and certain populations of salmon, and we also ensure healthy ecosystems and habitats for fish species and all of that backed by a sound science. So this map here shows you where our West Coast regional offices are located, and we also have a number of science centers in a few locations throughout the West Coast. When most people think of NOAA fisheries, they only think of commercial fishing. However, we actually also manage sustainable saltwater recreational fishing. Um, often in California, you'll hear about the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, that's the state agency that's tasked with managing those fish stocks that are typically found in, in state waters between zero and three nautical miles from the coast. NOAA Fisheries, on the other hand, uh, manages those fish populations that are typically found between three and 200 miles and, and even offshore in international waters. And our management is done in partnership with and based on recommendations by the Pacific Fishery Management Council, and the Pacific Council consists of federal, state, tribal, industry, and the public at large members, and they also have special committees devoted to specific fisheries, science and statistics, habitat, enforcement, and legislation. And NOAA Fisheries takes these recommendations from the Pacific Council, and concurrently with the state fish and wildlife agencies, we set regulations with limits on how much fish can be caught based on what the fish population can support, while also considering other factors like social, cultural, and economic impacts. Uh, in recreational fisheries, limits are often put in place through things like bag limits, like how many fish per trip you can catch, uh, depth and area limits, so where you can fish, and seasons, when you can fish. This is a sample of the fish species that we manage on the West Coast here at NOAA Fisheries. They include salmon, ground fish, which are your rockfish and link cod, cabazon. You have your coastal pelagic species, which are your sardines, anchovies, mackerel, uh, Pacific halibut, and highly migratory species, that's your tuna, sharks, and billfish. And many of these species are found right offshore here in our local waters of the Southern California Bayou. Uh, again, these species are also found in international waters, and so NOAA Fisheries is heavily involved in international fisheries negotiations, we participate in a number of international fisheries commissions to promote international cooperation and achieve effective, responsible marine stewardship of our shared resources. Our agency has a national saltwater recreational fisheries policy, and it highlights our nation's commitment to sustainable recreational fisheries. The policy has three main goals, support and maintain sustainable saltwater recreational fisheries resources, including healthy marine and estuarine habitats, promote saltwater recreational fishing for the social, cultural, and economic benefit of the nation, and enable enduring participation in and enjoyment of saltwater recreational fisheries through science-based conservation and management. And we are successfully meeting those goals by supporting ecosystem conservation and enhancement, advancing innovative solutions to evolving science management and environmental challenges, promoting public access to quality recreational fishing opportunities through actions like supporting our youth and veteran fishing trips, coordinate with state and federal entities in both science and management, providing scientifically sound and trusted social, cultural, economic, and ecological information, and communicating and engaging with the recreational fishing community. So what is sustainable fishing? Well, sustainable fishing, which is part of our mission at the Sustainable Fisheries Division of NIMS West Coast Region, has three core concepts. It's fishing that's done in a way to maintain healthy fish stocks, eliminate overfishing and rebuild overfish stocks, and increase the long-term economic and social benefits to the nations from our living marine resources. 
Next, I want to share ways for people to be responsible anglers and contribute to that foundation of sustainable fishing. The first is to know your fish. Uh, it's really important to know what you can and cannot keep um, to ensure that you're following the regulations and not impacting any of those species with low population numbers. There are many guides and resources out there to help you identify fish. Uh, this in particular shows a portion of a guide that highlights a number of common rockfish species found in Southern and Central California, of which there are many. And the three listed at the top there are not allowed to be kept and must be released, while the three on the bottom can be kept. And you can see here, you know, they all are kind of orange and red, and when you're bringing them on deck, they can look pretty similar, so it's important to have a handy guide available. Next, follow catch and release best practices. Some people only catch and release, others release all the fish they aren't going to eat, and sometimes you catch fish you aren't allowed to keep. In each case, it's important to follow the best practice guidelines for releasing fish. It can vary by species, but in general, there are two main tips. Choose the right gear and handle with care. In choosing the right gear, you can minimize fight time, or that time it takes to reel in fish. Uh, typically, you can use heavier tackle and heavier line, which is beneficial for bringing in the fish sooner, and the fish brought in sooner are less exhausted and more likely to recover quickly. Also, use barbless and circle hooks. This allows hooks to be easily removed from the fish's mouth. Circle hooks help by only hooking fish in the mouth, which prevents any damage to gills or the stomach, and barbless hooks also allow for less damage. Hook can slide out of the mouth easier. When handling with care, don't remove the fish from the water if possible, and keep hands wet when handling. That protects the slime layer. Also, if you're gonna take a photo, have the camera ready before pulling the fish out of the water, hold the fish properly by avoiding sensitive spots like the gills, and then get the fish back in the water as soon as possible. Lastly, use the right tools. Dehooking devices are available that help remove hooks. You can also use a release device for the appropriate species. I'll show you in the next slide that release devices are really important when sending back rockfish. And these are just a few of the tips to help you get started on catch and release best practices. You can find a number of guides on our website that contain uh, guidelines for species like salmon, tunas, and billfish. So I mentioned release devices. Rockfish suffer from what is called barotrauma, or pressure shock, uh, when they're brought up from the deep depths. The air bladder in their insides actually balloons up and it causes their stomach and eyes to pop out. And when you go to release these fish, you can't get them back down. Think of trying to force a balloon or a ball underwater, it's really hard to do. However, these fish can be released and they can do so in a way that will let them survive. And it's done by using what's called a descending device or a release device. Uh, the objective for using these devices is releasing the rockfish back down at the depth you caught it. Uh, these are just some of the devices that exist in the market today. Uh, you either hook or clamp the fish onto the device and then you drop the device on a weighted line back to the depth where you caught the fish. Uh, and it's extremely important for releasing rockfish that either can't or won't be kept because they are slow growing species and slow to mature. And older, larger rockfish produce a significantly greater number of little rockfish than the younger, smaller ones. So if you descend them and let them grow, the more and more rockfish they can produce and the more fishing opportunities you'll have in the future. And you can also make your own descending device. Shown here is an inverted barbless hook. That hook's been filed down, uh, and you have the weight there on the bottom, and then your line tied to the top of the hook. Uh, another method is using a weighted milk crate. You can simply throw the weighted milk crate over the top of the fish, trapping them beneath, and once you've dropped it to the appropriate depth, just pull the crate back up. Anglers can contribute to sustainable fishing by also participating in cooperative research and citizen science projects. Offshore of the Southern California Bight, NOAA Fisheries has partnered with three charter vessels to sample rockfish populations once a year at over 200 sites. And opportunities exist through programs like the California Cooperative Fisheries Research Program, where anglers can go out on charter vessels and collect fish samples and contribute to the science and understanding of those fish populations. In addition to these special trips, Anglers are also often asked about their catch when they return to shore by scientists from the state fish and wildlife agencies. 
Uh, NOAA Fisheries and the state agencies also conduct mail and telephone surveys to collect additional data on the participation rates of anglers, and all of that data that anglers provide is extremely essential for assessing the health of and managing those fish populations. To provide an example of what cooperative research can achieve, between 2014 and 2016, using local captains and anglers' knowledge of where and how to catch canary rockfish, over a hundred of these somewhat hard to find fish were captured in the Puget Sound, Washington area for research. And the data collected on this trip actually contributed to the delisting of canary rockfish or removal of that species from the endangered species list. And it also actually expanded protections for another species of rockfish, the yellow eye rockfish. Another avenue that anglers can contribute to sustainable fishing is by supporting our understanding of species through fish carcass donations. Our scientists often put out requests for samples of these fish, and these samples allow us to look at what fish is feeding on, where the fish might be moving to and from, uh, and whether that fish is contributing to the growth of the population, so are they reproducing? Uh, our Southwest Fisheries Science Center has been collecting Pacific bluefin tuna samples from anglers for the last few years to determine just that. Anglers can also participate in tagging programs. Our Southwest Fisheries Science Center has been providing billfish tags to individual anglers, charter boats, and tournaments across the Pacific since 1963 and over 55,000 tags have been deployed on billfish worldwide. Uh, most of those tags were deployed on billfish like striped marlin off Southern California, Central America, and Hawaii. And in addition, anglers also complete the International Angler Billfish Survey, and that allows us to compile information on catch and fishing effort by location and track changes in the health of billfish stocks. While we're out fishing, here are some other tips we can take to be responsible ocean stewards, and that's to prevent marine debris. Here are a few tips on how. Have a safe, easy place to store used fishing line and gear on your boat. Something that's out of the wind so the line won't get blown away, or stuff that cut line into your pocket and throw it in the trash later. Uh, drop off used fishing line in designated recycling tubes. A number of harbors and piers along our coast have these large white PVC tubes for collecting fishing line that can then be recycled. And please only use these tubes for putting fishing line in. Don't put other trash in. In general, reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. As many are aware, our beaches become inundated with trash after large rains, and that trash also ends up out to sea. I can't tell you how many times I've seen balloons floating way offshore, and it's basically every time I go out now. Uh, some organizations are even starting contests for how many balloons you can pick up in a single day out on the ocean. So do your part to keep waste out of the ocean, and if time allows, participate in beach cleanups. Uh, September is International Coastal Cleanup Day, but anytime you visit the beach, it's a good day to pick up trash. And taking these little steps when you're fishing or enjoying the ocean can help keep our environment clean. Seals and sea lions can get frustrating for anglers, especially when they're stealing catch or invading your boat or the docks in your harbor. There are a few steps that anglers can take to reduce interactions and keep seals and sea lions wild. And the first, don't feed them. When you feed them, they'll start to associate humans with food. It's not natural, it's harmful, and it's also illegal. Don't discard bait or clean fish remains into the water. Again, that'll cause them to associate the area and humans with food and attract them to your boat. Uh, change fishing locations if you see sea turtles or marine mammals present, and if they start showing interest in your bait and catch. Uh, release catch quietly away from marine mammals. Wait until a sea lion's distracted or away from the boat to let it go. If you're releasing rockfish, uh, I like to drop it down quickly with a descending device using a little heavier weight. That way the fish sinks quicker and the, the sea lion can't grab it. And also the same goes when you're bringing in fish. Reel it in quickly and discreetly. Uh, like I mentioned earlier with the heavier line uh, for bringing in fish quicker to minimize that fight time, that also helps you get the fish to the boat quicker and avoid that marine mammal interaction. And last, post a lookout. Watch for sea turtles and marine mammals in the water when you're transiting, uh, especially in areas known to have both. Uh, Huntington Harbor and Mission Bay are, are actually common areas for sea turtles, so keep someone on you know, the front of the boat looking out. Uh, give them plenty of space too. If you see that you're getting close, put the engine in neutral to avoid any injury to them. 
There are a lot more resources on our website for being a responsible ethical angler. Visit fisheries.noaa.gov, click on West Coast under the Regions tab, then Fisheries, then Recreational Fisheries. We have info on our latest engagement plan, resources for anglers that like catch and release best practices, brochures, and guidelines like we covered here today. There's also a link to sign up for our email listserv so you can stay informed on the latest happenings from NOAA Fisheries that involve recreational fishing on the West Coast. So thank you. Thanks for taking the time to listen to our sustainable recreational fishing presentation for NOAA Day at the Aquarium. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. My email is listed here. And again, check out our website for more information. Thanks again.